So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, one has to do for these kinds of lectures is, is look up the person whose lecture uh, is we're honoring here, Clem Finch. And uh, I didn't uh, ever meet Clem Finch, so I looked him up on Wikipedia, actually. And I found one interesting fact. He was actually born the same day as my mother, July 4th, 1915. Uh, but then I asked uh, David Nathan, who's sort of the Clem Finch of Boston, if you will, um, what were her, his recollections of Clem Finch. And I'll just read them because I think it does sort of add to what uh, has already been said. Uh, Clem was George Thorne's chief resident, that's at the Brigham Hospital, and was followed by Don Thomas. He saw no future in hematology at the Brigham and was recruited by the amazing Bob Williams to the new effort in Seattle. Williams was to Seattle what Holly Smith became to San Francisco. Don, that's Don Thomas, was acting a chief of hematology at the Brigham when I was a student. That's when I established a close relationship with him. But he would have languished in Cooperstown, that's where Don Thomas did his dog transplant studies, had Clem not brought him to Seattle. But Clem couldn't stand the early days of bone marrow transplant. He liked bench science, not blood and guts. So that's why he then went into erythropoiesis and, and iron um, metabolism. Uh, so David, who's uh, our sort of distinguished Clem Finch in Boston, uh, had those recollections. What I'd like to try to do today is give you a sense of uh, where things are in terms of applying genetics now to try to deal with a problem we've had for many years in hematology, and that is uh, sickle cell disease and perhaps uh, the other major hemoglobinopathy th thalassemia. Uh, and that brings me to another um, giant of Seattle, who I was particularly fond of, uh, Arno Matulski. Uh, we actually co-chaired a committee 20 years ago on gene therapy for the NIH, so I got to know Arno quite well. And in 1974, he said the hemoglobin research plays a role in human biochemical genetics similar to that of Drosophila. Uh, many fundamental concepts have been clarified, and um, and I think that's really quite a, a prescient statement, even uh, at that time, uh, 40 years ago. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been attracted to this field, because there are both um, uh, applications of the science, but also many basic insights that we've learned uh, along the way. Uh, so the uh, one way to frame what I'll talk about today is, is from the aspect of sickle cell disease, which uh, I think we know is the first molecular disease, a term coined by Linus Pauling. Uh, and then uh, Vernon Ingram, who was actually a professor of mine at MIT, it was, uh, he had moved from England to MIT, uh, discovered the actual point mutation in uh, the sickle molecule. Uh, there's, a, there's sort of a sense, perhaps, uh, some that, that we know all about this disorder and, and, you know, it's taken care of, but it's not. There are more than 350,000 new births a year, particularly on the African continent, and uh, somewhere around 150,000 deaths a year. In the U.S., there are about 70,000 individuals with sickle cell disease. Uh, and uh, in the sub-Saharan Africa, about 90% die under age five, usually of infection. Um, bone marrow transplant we've known for many years is curative, but uh, there are very relatively few matches in the uh, population. And this is not a scalable procedure, and I think that'll be one of the issues going forward. And hydroxyurea is the standard of care, but there really haven't been major therapies uh, for many years. Uh, and so despite knowing really the genetic basis of this disease for more than 60 years. And no current therapy relies on that information. Uh, and I think this is uh, uh, maybe a, a, a warning for those who think that once we know the genetics and, and some of the pathophysiology, we're, we're home. Uh, on, on the other hand, I think it's actually, uh, I won't quite say shameful, but I think it's, um, it's a comment on sort of where emphasis has been placed in research maybe over the last few decades. 
uh, and this is just a, uh, a, from a review of David Weatherall, who is in some ways the Clem Finch of Oxford, I guess, uh, where he, he wrote a review in the journal Blood, basically <coughs> showing that really this was more of a global epidemic and a growing problem rather than one uh, uh, lessening over time. Uh, so in order to, to start, it's just necessary to, re to recall a few sort of basic facts about hemoglobin and hemoglobin genes. Hemoglobin is a tetramer. Uh, there are alpha chains and beta-like chains. We won't say anything about the alpha-like chains, so you can essentially uh, dismiss that. Uh, and we'll only focus on chromosome 11, uh, which includes uh, a locus control region, which is an enhancer or re a regulatory element for the whole locus, an embryonic gene, two fetal genes, and an adult gene. And really, all you have to pay attention to are the gamma genes and the beta gene. And fetal hemoglobin is uh, two gammas and a beta, and adult is um, uh, uh, two betas and um, alpha. Both have a two gammas and alpha, sorry. So what do we know about fetal hemoglobin? Why has it been interesting uh, for this field. Well, one is we've known for many years it's protective in sickle cell disease. And this was a clinical observation uh, that babies who are born uh, destined to have sickle cell disease uh, are actually protected around time of birth because they have a lot of fetal hemoglobin, uh, which is uh, a great uh, inhibitor of sickle polymerization. Uh, and we've also known from a natural history study uh, supported by the NIH, that those individuals who have a higher level of fetal hemoglobin uh, on average uh, have uh, improved survival. And there are many uh, family studies, genetic studies, which show that. So this is really uh, about all one has to pay attention to in the talk today. That is that we switch from the gamma chain to the beta chain roughly around the time of birth or thereafter. Uh, and all the important mutations uh, are in the beta chain, either sickle cell disease or thalassemia mutations, which affect the amount of beta. And in adults, we have about 1% hemoglobin that's actually restricted to a small population of cells called F cells. So we don't completely extinguish the fetal expression. Uh, and from a variety of studies, uh, it's generally thought that about 20% fetal hemoglobin, if evenly distributed in cells, would be therapeutic, at least in sickle cell disease. So one doesn't have to go all the way up to the 100%. Uh, and so that's been a goal of the field. And uh, the field has had a number of uh, investigators and labs for many years, and this is uh, a slide of a meeting held in 2004 in Oxford, a meeting that was actually started by George Stamatianopoulos. I don't see George here, but I see Thalia here. Oh, George is here. Great. Uh, and this meeting is actually going to have its uh, uh, meet uh, for its 40th anniversary this coming September in Oxford again. But here's George and here's uh, David Weatherall. Here's the, actually David Nathan, who's the Clem Finch of Boston. Uh, and uh, this meeting has had a lot to do with uh, stimulating interest and in, in supporting this uh, area. Uh, so really the, the problem uh, in a way comes down to human genetic variation. And uh, what do we know about variation of hemoglobin F in, in people? Well, we know there are common there's common variation in the level, and that was established by twin studies showing that the level residual level of fetal hemoglobin in adults is inheritable. Uh, and there's also rare variation, single base substitutions, uh, which are rare, but they're very interesting because they're promoter mutations in this specific case. And these increase rather than decrease expression. So these are, are in a way beneficial mutations. And here's a, a paper from more than 30 years ago, uh, one from, uh, from Bernie Forget's lab, we have Francis Collins was a postdoc at the time, uh, and here's one from George Stam's lab, and this is so-called Greek hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, where there's a single substitution G to A. And we'll come back to this later. Uh, this has been sort of an enigma for um, many years. Uh, so what do we know about uh, 
what's been the course of research in this field? Well, we knew from genetic studies and family studies many, many years ago that fetal hemoglobin is inherited and it's beneficial uh, to have more of it in the hemoglobinopathies. The globin loci were cloned around 1980 and sequenced. So we've had the DNA sequence in the entire cluster for probably 35 or 36 years now. Uh, and that did not provide um, amazing insights, I would say, offhand into how the process of switching from fetal to adult hemoglobin occurs. So another cautionary note that having the DNA sequence doesn't necessarily provide all the information. Uh, transgenic mouse studies uh, in the 80s established a locus control region. And for those who are interested in gene expression, particularly cancer, uh, the locus control region has kind of been renamed super enhancers. So those who go to cancer meetings will hear super enhancers all the time, but it's really the same. Uh, we in Gary Felsenfels labs independently clone the GATA1 transcription factor in 1989, and that's the master regulator for erythroid gene expression. Uh, and there were a number of other things that happened along the way, but uh, we were kind of stuck uh, until genome-wide association studies really provided uh, the first solid insights into what genes actually regulate fetal hemoglobin in adults. Uh, and uh, for those who may not know, but I suspect uh, many of you do, a genome-wide association study is, is really a genetic study of populations uh, where one gets um, a polymorphism across the genome and tries to correlate uh, the location of the appropriate um, genes. Uh, and in this case, uh, one gets what's called a Manhattan plot, which is relatively simple in the case of Globin. I put the Empire State Building over the, the only part we're going to focus on today, which is the locus BCL11A on chromosome 2, uh, the MIB locus on chromosome 6, was also uh, uh, correlating with hemoglobin F expression uh, and, uh, and variation in the beta globin cluster itself. And we've known for many years, obviously, that that's a site of potential variation. Uh, what's particularly interesting about these is that if you sum them, they may account for as much as 50% of the total variation, which for this kind of study is sort of out of the ballpark. Um, and the other interesting thing is there are only three major peaks hits, which is also unusual for GWAS studies. Um, and uh, since this one was, this particular one and the parallel one were done 10 years ago, uh, there's been effort to try to sort of increase the resolution and find additional uh, um, genes that correlate. And I think there are very few, if any, that have been validated since. So it's a maybe a simpler system. Uh, the, the problem then becomes, how does one go from a genome-wide association, which is the entire genome, to something relevant to what you're interested in, the disease or um, perhaps even a therapeutic target? Uh, and this is just an old uh, slide taken from NIH website on genome-wide association studies, where one can find thousands of of hits for many, many genes all over the genome. And for most of these, uh, there's really no understanding of, of how the particular correlation fits into the biology of, uh, or the disease. Um, we've, uh, we've known for some time now uh, from early on that, in fact, most of the uh, uh, variation occurs outside the coding a portion of the genome. It's a much bigger portion of the genome, the so-called dark matter, if you will, uh, and uh, roughly 90 plus percent uh, of these genome hits are going to be outside coding regions. And I'll just say here that none of the mutations that have been identified and none of the variation identified that correlates with hemoglobin F is in coding regions. It's all outside coding regions, so presumably regulatory. Uh, what we've done over the last uh, uh, 10 years is go from the genome uh, to actually target sequences for therapeutics that are actually being exploited as we talk now for therapy uh, in clinical trials that are open. Uh, and I'll, I won't touch on all the uh, 
parts uh, from here to here, but I will just sort of uh, focus a couple of key things in here and then describe where the clinical work is now going. But uh, basically, we understand this particular genetic variation in this particular gene, B11A. Uh, we understand it now at, at the nucleotide level and which nucleotides are important for uh, its function and for its variation. So this is the gene. It's a big, relatively large gene, but all the genome variation that's important that correlates with hemoglobin F is within a large intervening sequence, so it's not in the coding region of the gene. And it over, uh, sort of overlies DNA hypersensitive sites. These are sites of presumed regulatory elements, which are present in the chrominant of red cell uh, precursors, but not in the brain or B cells. And I'll just tell you, this gene is important in both brain and B cells. It's actually expressed 10 or 20 fold higher in B cells as required. It's also required in brain development. Uh, and so this suggested this was a erythroid specific variation, or if the effect was erythroid specific. If you blow this region up, this is what it looks like. There are actually three DNA hypersensitive sites which are located 55, 58, and 62 kilobases from the promoter. This suggested it, it was an enhancer, that is, it promotes gene expression in a particular lineage. Uh, we showed that in transgenic mice, but I won't show you that evidence. But what's also important about this gene is expressed in, in many other places. It's expressed in the red cell lineage, expressed in B cells, it's actually important in hematopoietic stem cells where it's expressed at low level. Some think it's important in mammary development and, and triple negative breast cancer, and it's also important in brain development. So one of the important questions is how specific is this enhancer? Is this variation really only affecting expression in, in the erythroid cells, or might it ex affect expression elsewhere? And one way we approached that was to go to the mouse and take out the entire enhancer region, which is about 12 kilobases in length, and make mice. And those mice are perfectly viable, which is not true of the gene knockout. The mice die around time of birth. And the only tissue that's affected in expression are the red cells. They're about 100 fold down in expression. The B cells and brain are, expression is normal. Hematopoietic function is normal uh, in bone marrow transplant. Uh, and if one looks at what happens to human globin genes that you put into this environment, they do exactly what happens in the, in the knockout setting. Here's what happens in the wild type setting. In the fetal liver of a mouse, the human beta gene is expressed like this. The gamma gene, the fetal gene is shut off early in the mouse. Uh, in the homozygote for this deletion of the enhancer, you basically invert these. Here's the gamma gene, the fetal gene is not shut off. And here's the beta gene, which is not turned on well. And this essentially is identical to the knockout. And this shows you how powerful this factor is in terms of regulating the switch of the globins. We wanted to, to understand more about how this enhancer functions. And one way we approached it was to use uh, the technology of genome editing now uh, CRISPR-Cas9 editing, which I'll come to in a little more detail in a second, uh, to actually dissect this. And in order to do that, we did a, a unbiased screen in which we pooled the so-called guide RNAs, which target the Cas9 in the genome. We used a very interesting cell line, which is recently sort of revolutionized work in the field. This is an immortalized, essentially erythroid progenitor cell called UDEP, made in Japan. Uh, you can then edit these cells, sort out the cells that have high fetal hemoglobin. I think this is taking its own course here. Uh, deconvolute the sequence. And if one lays it out here, here's plus 55, which is a central one of these hypersensitive sites. There's a stripe of enrichment for hemoglobin F, which approximates that of a knockout. This is knocking out the coding region of the gene. There's a little blip over here and here, but for all intents and purposes, the major activity is in one discrete region of this enhancer. And what's remarkable about it is this is a 10 or 12 KB enhancer in the mouse and human, but yet there's a limited region of about 15 to 20 bases, which is absolutely essential for its activity. 
uh, and it flanks the GATA transcription factor binding site, which is perhaps not surprising. Uh, and it's basically the Achilles heel for this enhancer. More than two thirds of the activity of the enhancer is really localized in this specific region to this point. Uh, so a single cut in the DNA followed by sloppy joining, so-called non-homologous end joining, nearly approximates, not quite, but nearly approximate loss of the enhancer. And the enhancer is absolutely required for expression of the gene. Uh, so this is actually a summary of sort of the, the genetics. Uh, and this was from a commentary in Science, which uh, actually depicted it, I think, quite well. In the normal setting, uh, the, the gene, the repressor gene is expressed, the protein then goes, somehow represses the fetal gene, and in sickle cell disease, you'd have sickle, the normal uh, sort of phenotype of sickle cell disease. The natural variation, which we believe it reduces expression about 40% in our estimate, will reduce the amount of protein, relieve repression, you'll have a little more fetal hemoglobin, it's not quite enough. If you knock out the gene or take the enhancer out, you have essentially um, no repressor and fetal hemoglobin will be expressed and we think would be uh, essentially curative. Uh, so this is actually what the, the current clinical uh, translation is, is uh, amounting to at this point. It's essentially to use a bone marrow transplant, uh, gene therapy uh, essentially, where one takes out hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, modifies them in some way ex vivo in the lab, conditions the patient, reintroduces these cells back in, uh, and if you've modified enough cells, hopefully there'll be um, a positive clinical benefit. Uh, so what's actually being done right now? Well, not shown here, I'll come to it in a second. There are gene therapy trials, uh, particularly by a company in Boston called Bluebird, uh, putting in a globin gene into uh, sickle cell patients. In this case, a globin gene that doesn't sickle or prevents sickling. Uh, there have been a few patients that have been reported. Uh, the results of one patient are quite good. The other ones are somewhat mixed, so there's still work to do. The same is going on in thalassemia. Uh, but the alternative is to induce fetal hemoglobin as a strategy. Uh, and what's being actually <coughs> translated as we speak, one is, genome engineering of the enhancer right at the Achilles heel. Another is trying to recreate these odd hereditary persistence mutations, these promoted mutations which are beneficial. That's not actually being done right now for reasons I can discuss later. Uh, and another alternative is to sort of combine gene therapy to downregulate uh, expression of the gene using a shRNA, an inhibitory RNA, rather than actually modify the gene itself. This is a lentivirus, a sort of gene therapy strategy. And this is one actually now open as a trial at Children's Hospital in Boston. And the first patients will be treated in uh, within the next couple of months. Uh, the other thing people always ask is, why don't you just fix that single mutation? If gene editing is so good, why don't you just fix the mutation, be done with it? Uh, it's not quite efficient enough today. Uh, it may be there at some point, but that's not being done as we speak. So if one wants to do this, one has to ask, well, how much expression do you want to have at the end? Uh, how much do you want to reduce expression of the gene? And for this gene, we actually have, I think, quite remarkable genetics that points at what you need to do. Uh, there's a natural occurring allelic variation which reduces expression about 40%. Uh, it doesn't have a major effect on phenotype yet. There are very rare individuals who are haploinsufficient. So by definition, they have 50% level. These are individuals who have a deletion on one chromosome. The other chromosome is normal. Or they have actually, there are a few patients now with point mutations uh, that are essentially haploinsufficient. They have a developmental syndrome, sometimes called an autistic-like syndrome, uh, but uh, uh, their, so their pro major problem is not their blood. But if one obtains their blood, which has been done in about a dozen individuals now, the average level is around 13%. Uh, 
which is almost in the therapeutic range, not quite. There's a wide variation here, probably due to other genetic contributions. But so we know now what 40% does, essentially, what 50% does. And from the preclinical studies using shRNA, uh, one can construct this kind of curve, which uh, shows the correlation of reduction of expression with the amount of fetal hemoglobin. And basically, you could draw a line here if you want to, let's say, uh, get to 25% fetal hemoglobin. It's about 60% reduction of the repressor is what you need. So this is a quantitative repressor. Um, uh, it's not linear in terms of its effect, but uh, this is about where one wants to be. So this is not a situation where one has to inhibit something entirely. Uh, one can uh, do it modestly and still have large benefit. Uh, so this comes to backing up about editing. So why is, why is this sort of revolutionized uh, this field as well as many other fields in biology overall? Uh, and so I guess one question, why would you want to edit gene other than to uh, perhaps cure someone? Well, I think for, for most of us in the laboratory, testing the gene or protein function uh, is really critical. For many years, we would hypothesize about uh, pathways and targets. Uh, and in some cases, that was good because you couldn't actually test whether or not you were right or wrong. So you could always be right. Uh, now you can actually test it and find out whether you're right or wrong. Uh, and so I, I think that's where science has gone more recently. You can use screens for discovery. Uh, you can map functional domains of proteins now, and uh, which is essentially uh, peppering an entire protein coding region uh, or, or the gene, respective gene, with guide RNAs. And one can actually see protein domains that are important and ones that are not important. This is actually going to be very powerful. You can dissect regulatory elements in C2, which is what I told you about the enhancer, and you can use it in uh, gene therapy, I believe. Uh, there are two uh, really outcomes of, of uh, editing. Uh, they all, the, the editing strategies all use a, a break in DNA, and you can either have sloppy end joining, which is called non homologous end joining, where a few nucleotides may be taken out, things sewn back, or you can have a donor and make it a perfect uh, replacement, uh, so called homologous um, uh, recombination. Uh, this is uh, where one might want to be with the sickle mutation, uh, but it's it's more challenging to have the efficiency and specificity that one needs really in a, in the clinical experiment. One of the other aspects that's important uh, in hematology is this pathway is very active or active in hem in hematopoietic stem cells, but because hematopoietic stem cells tend to be are quiescent this is much less active. And so, although one can uh, do homologous recombination in cells within the laboratory and, and think you're doing well, when you actually put stem cells into the hematopoietic system, often the representation of the edit is much reduced. The editing field obviously has undergone many transformations. The, uh, the first approach was actually conventional gene targeting uh, Smithies and Capecchi uh, decades ago. Uh, this is uh, very a very accurate procedure, but is a very low efficiency and would never uh, be translatable in the clinic. Uh, zinc fingers and talons are essentially engineered proteins, uh, uh, DNA binding proteins, which can uh, have tremendous accuracy uh, and specificity. Uh, they've been in clinical trials from company Sangamo in HIV, modifying the HIV receptor. Uh, and um, the only problem here is they require lots of tinkering so that not every laboratory can do it. Uh, the nice thing about CRISPR system is that anybody can do it uh, and it's very accurate and the specificity in, is improving tremendously. And so why is this system so important now? 
it's an RNA directed system, uh, which greatly simplifies experimental design. Uh, you can target things uh, to multiple loci at the same time uh, with one protein. You just need these small so-called guide RNAs. Uh, it's read readily multiplexable, high throughput. Uh, it's modular. You can use it for a variety of other things that people are doing. Uh, and there's absolutely no expertise needed to do sort of the basic functions. Uh, probably there may be some high schools that are doing it now, I suspect. Uh, it's that simple. But we've come a long way. This was actually uh, the classic Smithies paper uh, from 1985, uh, where, uh, and this is really one of the experiments that was cited in the Nobel Prize that Oliver Smithies received uh, for gene uh, modification. Uh, and in this case, the modification was in one per thousand transformed cells, that is cells they got the DNA into. Uh, that's obviously not what uh, is uh, done today. So we've come a long way. Uh, Repairing the sickle mutation, I said, would be the easiest thing, but it's it's challenging, not only for the correction of the mutation, but also because in the process of correction, you make small insertions or deletions around, and so you sort of inactivate the gene at the same time. Uh, so what are the potential targets then for editing in the uh, the hemoglobin disorders, many have been proposed, other proteins, regions of genes. There are really only uh, three serious candidates. I believe one is repairing the allele itself, the sickle cell allele. Second would be recreating these kinds of uh, naturally existing mutations, hereditary persistence mutations. Uh, th this isn't being done for a variety of sort of technical reasons and other. Uh, and modifying the B cell of an A enhancer is really the one that has been, uh, had the most activity to date. Uh, and so when I look at this field now, uh, I see sort of two faces to it. Uh, one is the genetics. We're now at a point where I think we understand enough of the genetics, enough science has been done that it's being translated. And so the advantage is one can use genetic therapy today, or at least put them into trial. Uh, the downside is they're clinically involved. They require a bone marrow transplant and serious medical care, uh, and they're low throughput. You, have, you basically uh, bone marrow transplant. If one can make bone marrow transplant much simpler, reduce conditioning, perhaps with antibodies as being proposed, one might be able to apply this even more broadly. But I think the long-term future is still in drugs, small molecules, and in this case, ones that inhibit the critical aspects of the switch, the repression itself, because these could be population-based, would have high throughput, and uh, the real problem is they're challenging, can this actually be done? So where are we today in the, in the sort of genetic therapy? This is sort of the current uh, state of things. Uh, at Children's Hospital in Boston, David Williams is the PI of a trial that's a lentiviral trial. So it's really a traditional gene therapy trial in a way, expressing a shRNA to knock down the repressor in an erythroid-specific manner. The advantage of this is one can actually, uh, with a very good shRNA, reduce the expression uh, even more than one can do by modifying the enhancer, we think. One can really push it almost to the extreme. Uh, and this trial is now open and they're enrolling patients who are being prepared for a transplant um, uh, probably this summer. Uh, Sangamo, in a collaboration with Biogen, which is now spin-off BioVerative, are using zinc fingers, uh, which are highly specific for the uh, Achilles heel that I showed in the enhancer. Uh, and this trial is first gonna uh, uh, they have approval to go ahead for uh, uh, beta thalassemia uh, for a variety of, of sort of clinical reasons of ease, but uh, I th their plan is to go forward with sickle cell thereafter. Uh, and CRISPR Therapeutics, another um, company in, in Boston, a new uh, engineering company with Vertex company also in Boston have teamed up and they're similarly doing the same region uh, for beta thalassemia and sickle. And then Novartis, uh, 
with another editing company in Talia are doing uh, really the same thing. So there are uh, essentially three, three entities going after the same sequence, two with CRISPR and one with zinc fingers, uh, and uh, one the more traditional kind of gene therapy. Uh, and I think over the next uh, year or two, we'll get a sense of, of do these work, how well they work, and which approach is uh, preferable, if any of them. Uh, and so this is the Boston Children's one using an shRNA, an appropriate vector. Uh, so what are some of the issues that one has to worry about in editing generally, not just in this particular one? One is targeting the proper sequences to edit. You must have really preclinical evidence that you're actually going to edit something to be beneficial. We think that exists in this case. Uh, the proper choice and acquisition of cells. In this case, one has to edit the hematopoietic stem cells because those are the only cells that will repopulate the, the red cells uh, for lifelong. Uh, in the case of HIV, for uh, the HIV um, receptor, uh, Sangamo had targeted the T cells, which one can uh, more easily expand and, and transplant. Uh, you need a platform for delivery, and it really... People always ask, well, which is the best platform? It really doesn't matter as long as the platform works. It could be zinc fingers, it could be talons, it could be CRISPRs, or new systems. There are uh, new systems for base modification. There are new editing uh, sort of platforms coming along almost weekly now. Uh, do you need non-homologous end joining this sloppy process, or do you need um, homology directed repair, this precise one, and it really depends on, on what you need to do, what the efficiency needs to be, how many cells you have to modify, it's all really engineering, number of cells. Uh, what's acceptable is off target, this is a big um, question, uh, is it zero? Uh, well, almost nothing we do in medicine has zero consequences in terms of side effects, what's acceptable. Uh, really, it's going to be determined, I think, by practice. Um, and doing all of this above at, at clinical GMP scale, which is not a trivial matter at all. It requires lots of scale up and preparation. And I think one of the most uh, availability of patients for trial is important. There's no sense in doing it if you don't have patients who will uh, enter a trial. And probably the last one, which in many ways may be the most important sometimes, is a skilled clinical team. That it sounds uh, simple maybe to, to just take the cells, add something, put them back in, but it requires really an experienced team, not just in bone marrow transplant, but in uh, gene therapy as well. So in terms of genetic uh, therapy for the uh, the hemoglobin disorders, there are several options now that are discussed. Uh, I've told you which ones are kind of being moved forward, but there's gene correction, which is the, the most precise. There's knockdown of the uh, expression um, of the repressor which in Children's Hospital, disruption of the enhancer, which is the other approach. Uh, Gerd Blabel in Philadelphia has proposed uh, force looping, which is to bring the uh, LCR, the major regulatory element, to the gene itself. Uh, this is very elegant and demonstrates looping. I, I doubt it has any advantage over these kinds of approaches uh, because one has to express something to do this. Uh, and then there's gene addition, which is traditional gene therapy, which is what uh, Bluebird uh, has done in both sickle and thalassemia, which is to put a globin chain in, which doesn't keep the sort of normal physiology in the, of the, uh, uh, in, in, uh, doesn't restore the normal physiology, but uh, can be effective. And I think it's really going to be uh, what comes out of the trials that determines ultimately what is brought forward in a, in a larger way, actually, for eventually approved therapies. And that'll take several years, I suspect. And one thing one does have to worry about with CRISPR-Cas9 is off-target specificity. And uh, an exceptional MD-PhD student, Matt Canver, who worked in our lab, has actually uh, looked carefully at 
human genetic variation in this context because we very often think of well one genome sequence you know one cell line or one individual but in fact there's enough variation that one can predict uh, off-target effects that are either beneficial or not beneficial from uh, various uh, guides that one would use in uh, in editing and a number of people have done this as well uh, so in many respects I think we we're in relatively good place in the genetics now, uh, but we have really a lot more to do. And uh, B. salivinae is, is unique, I think, uh, in this instance in the genetics because it actually brings together uh, two aspects of sort of genetic um, principles. One is that common generic variation, in this case, affects the expression of this gene through an enhancer. Uh, which is a common theme in genome-wide association. Uh, but then there's rare genetic variation in the so-called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, the, the classic uh, Greek HBFH, which uh, George studied more than 30 years ago. Uh, this sequence does not bind B cell A. Uh, and we have uh, recent work on that, which indicates that these mutations prevent B cell A binding to the promoter. So the action is right at the promoter. And that then says that B seven a um, really targets the gamma promoter. So we have both rare and common variation acting essentially through one protein, uh, which is, I think, quite uh, unique. So, you know, if one remembers almost nothing else from what I said, really B seven a is like going to your, your thermostat on the wall. If you want to make uh, more fetal hemoglobin, you dial it down, uh, and uh, that's about um, the, the physiology as it appears from uh, the genetics. Originally, we thought B. A acted somewhere out here in a region between the gamma genes and delta for a variety of genetic reasons, uh, but through recent studies, which I don't won't go into today, but we'll go into tomorrow for those who return for hematology grand rounds. The action is actually at the gamma promoter, so it acts directly. Uh, and this is essentially where we are now today in terms of the mechanism of action. B A binds a unique sequence, uh, which is uh, novel for our DNA binding proteins, had not been identified previously. Uh, this sequence is repeated twice in the fetal gamma promoters, both of them, they're duplicated, the, the genes. And remarkably, it only binds in cells the more distal of the two of these repeats. And that's precisely where the mutations are in these naturally occurring variants, so-called hereditary persistence. And B11A, we believe, recruits co-repressor proteins which repress the promoter. And if one edits this site uh, or has a naturally occurring mutation, one bumps the protein off and gene expression uh, can go forward. So this repressor uh, has a number of you know, strong um, attributes, if you will, it's been identified in genome-wide association. It's been validated in what I call surrogate genetics, which are genetics in cell lines or primary cells. The haploid sufficiency, rare individuals are very important in sort of setting the bar for 50% level. Uh, and I think will be an important um, pathway to review, uh, to look at for those interested in neurodevelopment. And then the HPFH syndrome, the naturally occurring mutations in the binding site. Uh, and really the goal of what we're trying to do at this point in the lab is to basically flip the protein on its head, reduce its expression, to increase fetal hemoglobin, but to do this in a non-genetic way, to do this with uh, small molecules. Uh, and so this sort of raises a whole issue for maybe the entire field. Why has small molecule development been largely unsuccessful? And I say largely unsuccessful. There are a few molecules uh, that have been discovered sort of serendipitously, if you will, that increase fetal hemoglobin, but to a, a very small degree. And those are ones that 
I don't think we'll ever make it uh, further in, in sort of the clinic. Uh, and I think one of the reasons this is the case is because this fetal phenomenon, if you will, is not essential to the survival of the cell. There aren't a lot of checkpoints to it. It's not like cell death or cell replication. Uh, it's sort of an add-on in a way. There are some species, for example, mouse that don't have a fetal. So when really the safeguards aren't, aren't quite the same that you would have on a central pathway. And so there are relatively limited cellular targets that one could hit, uh, and one has to really focus on those most likely in order to get success. So the hypothesis that we're working on going forward is that in order to develop molecules that are actually capable of significant induction in vivo, and that means take one of us and get us to, quote, the therapeutic range, 20%, 30%. It's going to be necessary to target the specific components that are absolutely essential to repression. It is in a biochemical sense, be on target. Uh, this is challenging because I, there aren't an enormous number of targets. Currently, uh, today, we think there are two repressors, B11A and another one, LRF, which is quite potent, uh, which, for which there's no human genetics supporting it, but lots of other genetics. Uh, and they both interact with this NERD repressor complex, which has a number of subunits. But these are, we believe, the major guts of the repression. So this is kind of what nature has given us that we have to deal with. Uh, and really, the effort that's ongoing is to do what the pharmaceutical industry calls drugging the undruggable, and that is to have small molecules that inf inhibit transcription factor function. Uh, this is, requires a different kind of science than we've done previously. It requires chemistry, structural biology, pharmacology. It, it's really a, it's a, almost not a biology exercise anymore. Uh, but the advantage, and I think the reason this is so important in this area, but also others, is that it will enlarge the space for therapeutics. In other words, we'll have many, many more targets available if one can do this, not just in this disease, but others, uh, and includes many cancer targets, including oncogenic fusion proteins, which are really the, the inciters of, of many malignancies. Uh, there are a few examples to date where this has been done or um, near done, uh, but they, they haven't received enormous attention, and there's certainly uh, not many, very many examples. But that's sort of the direction we're currently heading now and sort of regrouping uh, to do this kind of, of work going forward. So in summary, I think we've had really enormous progress over the last several years in elucidating the key components of this enigmatic switch. Uh, some of the components are amenable to manipulation expression or gene editing to reactivate fetal hemoglobin. I think the model of switching is getting simpler rather than more complicated. And now uh, at least one of the major repressors we believe works through the promoter. Uh, we know the specific sequences. Uh, it may do other things too, this repressor. It may have more long distance effects, but that's at least one role. The first clinical trials based on mechanistic findings are underway or planned. Uh, and the findings in the clinical trials, I think, will need to be compared uh, to assess really what is the best way forward to actually have genetic uh, therapy available to patients. Uh, this work has gone on over, obviously over uh, really almost the last decade with a number of very talented people. Uh, Vijay Sankaram was an MD-PhD student who really took on the initial genetic aspects of this, working with Guillaume Lettre, a geneticist who's now in Montreal, had been with Joel Hirschhorn at the Broad Institute. Uh, Jan Zhu, who's at UT Southwestern, uh, really did a lot of the sort of guts of the molecular biology in this period. And then Dan Bauer, who uh, was a fellow, is now a faculty member. Matt Canver is an MD, PhD student who's graduating. And Sophia Kamran, a Harvard medical student, work together on the enhancer and its genetics and the target sequences. 
Uh, Cruz Smith, who's at now at Vertex, worked on the enhancer, and Sedin worked on uh, stem cells. Uh, and then the recent work on DNA binding and protein has been done in collaboration with Martha Bullock by Victoria Hargreaves in the lab. Uh, protein production, which has been essential, has been done by these individuals. And recently, breakthroughs in localizing the protein in chromatin have been done by Nan Lu and a computational uh, biologist, uh, Chan. And I'll stop at this point, take any questions. Thanks.